So there was this preacher, and he was walking one morning in his neighborhood, getting some exercise, when all of a sudden he noticed that there was a little bitty kitten up in a tree. Well, the preacher wanted to do something about it. He wanted to climb up in the tree and help the kitten down, but the tree was, you know, a little bit frail, and he was afraid that he might get hurt, and so he came up with an idea. He thought, if I just tie a rope, one end of that rope to the tree, and then another end of the rope to my bumper, I could pull away slowly and bend that tree with my car. And then he said, I could just go and reach out and, and grab the kitten. And so he went home and he got his car and he got some rope, came back, the kitten was still there. And so he hooked everything up. And as he began to drive away, pulling the tree down, the rope snapped. And immediately the tree whipped back up and man, that kitten went sailing clean out of sight. And so the preacher is like, oh no, what have I done? And so he's going around the neighborhood and he's trying to find this little kitten to make sure it's okay. And, and finally he just prayed, God, the, the, the kitten's in your hands. I, I, I can't find it. I tried to do what was right. Well, later that afternoon he was at the grocery store and he saw one of his members. It was lady and, and she had some cat food in her buggy. Now he knew that she was a cat hater. I mean she was very vocal about it. She hates cats and so he went up to her and he said, hey how you doing? He says, what's up with the cat food? I thought you absolutely hated cats. And she said, well preacher you know I do. But she said, let me tell you what happened. She said, for the last couple of weeks, she said, man, my daughter has been begging me for a kitten. And I looked at her and I said, honey, unless God gives you a cat himself, there is no way I am getting you a kitten. And she said, preacher, you're not going to believe me. She said, but every day my daughter would go out and get on her knees and pray to God for a cat. And she said, today I was looking out the window. She was out there on her knees praying and out of the sky a kitten fell right into her lap. And so she said, who am I to argue with God? She can have that cat. All right, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about prayer. And one of the things that we've been talking about is there are different ways that we can pray. It's okay to bow your head and close your eyes, but you don't have to pray that way all the time, especially since Paul says that we are to pray continually. Since Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, that we are to pray without what, church? without ceasing. And so we need to pray at times with our eyes open to the needs of those around us. Well, today we're going to continue talking about prayer, and we're going to look at another way to pray, and we're going to do that by going back to the book of Acts and looking at yet a couple of more significant moments there. Now, some of you may be saying, well, well, Slate, why are you doing this study from the book of Acts? What's so significant about the book of Acts? Well, the book of Acts is a history book. It tells us when the church was established, and, and it tells us, you know, some of the things that they did. And, and so we can look back at the first century church and and this is certainly something that's great for us to look back at because these people, they had a heart for God. And oftentimes they would pray on their knees. Look at Acts 9. We're going to start in verse 36. I'm not going to put it up on the screen. It's kind of a lengthy reading. But it says, In Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken to the upstairs room, all the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and the other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. 
Peter sent them out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. And he took her by the hand and he helped her to his feet, to her feet. And then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. And this became known all over Joppa and many people believed in the Lord. Now let's stop right there. And I want you to picture this in your mind. You have this woman by the name of Tabitha or Dorcas and she dies. Now she has had such a tremendous impact on her community with the widows and others making clothing for them, taking care of them, that they heard that Peter was nearby. So they go and they get Peter and they said, Peter, Tabitha is dead, do something. And so he sends them out of the room and he gets on his knees and he prays for her. And she comes back to life. Now this is not the only record of praying on their knees in Scripture. In fact, we go over to chapter 20. And let me kind of set the context for you. Here Paul is saying an emotional goodbye to the church, to the elders there at Ephesus. And this is what it says, when he had said this, in other words, when he had finished speaking to them, he did what? Church, he knelt down with all of them, and he what? And he prayed, and they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. Now turn over to the next chapter, Acts chapter 21, and here Paul um, is departing again, and Luke writes about it. They're leaving the city of Tyre. It says in verse 5, But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way, and all the disciples and their wives and their children accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we did what, church? We knelt to pray. And so notice, it's another emotional goodbye. And again, you see the church coming together, kneeling and praying together. Now, the reason I wanted to share these three passages with you this morning is because all three of these incidents were very significant. There was grief. There was the saying or or the... Uh, the, well, the saying of goodbye and, and leaving friends and, and family, church family members that, that Paul was never going to be able to see again. And, and the people are, are upset and they, they kneel and they pray together. Now the reason I wanted to share these three passages with you is I don't want you to get the impression that there are certain ways that you have to pray. Again, you can bow your head, you can close your eyes, you can pray with your eyes open, but there were also times in Scripture where they got down on their knees and they prayed. Now, I also want you to see they didn't pray that way all the time. These were some significant events. In fact, I would say that, you know, it it might not be a a great idea. In other words, I'm not encouraging you to go out of here today, maybe with friends and family, and go into a restaurant, and before you pray for your meal, everybody get on their knees right there in the restaurant. Because that might not... That might not... um, really share the right message. There might be some people in there, unbelievers, who think you're doing it for show or that you've got some sort of agenda that you're trying to bring in there. But there were times, and and maybe it was time when, when they were alone or when they got together as a Christian group, but they got down on their knees and they prayed. Knees bent. Now let me also say this. Even when you pray with your knees bent, or your eyes open, or your hands extended, that doesn't mean that God is going to say yes to your prayer. 
We've been talking about different postures, different methods. But here's the thing, just because you pray in a certain posture doesn't mean that God is automatically going to give you whatever you ask for. You see, our God, and we've talked about this from the very beginning, is not a genie that answers your, your wish or, or your command however you want Him to. Just because you pray a certain way. Well then, Slate, why would I want to pray on my knees? I mean, if, if God is, is not going to say yes to me because I pray a certain way, then why would I want to pray like that? Well, what I want to do this morning is I want us to look at why the first century church prayed that way. And we're also going to go all the way back to the Old Testament and look at why they prayed that way at times as well. But as far as the first century church is concerned, they prayed that way. If you look at these three, these three passages out of dependence and desperation... In other words, they realized there was no one else they could turn to. There was no one else who could solve their circumstances. There was no one else who could solve their problems. And so in desperation, in dependence upon God, man, they are crying out to God, God, we need you to get in this. God, we need you to help us with this. I started thinking about this this week and I thought about how different times in my life where I'd lost this. I mean, if I'm honest, there have been times in my life when I haven't fully been dependent upon God. There have been times in my life where I haven't desperately be, been seeking out God. And probably if, if every one of us were honest this morning, we've all found ourselves here, right? And the reason why is because we have nice homes to live in, right? And, and we've got all kinds of clothing, nice clothing to wear. And, and our, our cabinets, I mean, you open them up and they're full of food. And our bank accounts, they're padded. And I would say that probably for the most of us, we're in really good health. And so it's very tempting to think, you know... I'm making it fine on my own. I mean, I've got a job and I, hey, I'm, I'm working hard. I, I can take care of myself. And so at times I think it's very tempting to lose that dependence upon God, to lose that desperateness for God. It's like one person said, the problem is the situation is desperate, but we're not. Don't ever buy into that lie. Prayer is our lifeline as Christ followers. As we said last week, what oxygen is to the body, prayer is to the Christian because it connects us to God. Heard a story one time. I don't know how many of you, there may be some of you who grew up during the Depression and so you, you realize how tough those times were or maybe your parents grew up or your grandparents grew up during the Depression. Really rough. A lot of people struggling. Well, during that time, there was a guy by the name of Yates who lived in Texas, owned a ranch, raised sheep, and, and just like everyone else, man, he was really struggling. He was doing everything he could to keep from losing his ranch. Well, one day, there was an oil company that came to him and said, hey, we'd like to dig on your property. Well, man, he had done everything he could to keep from going into foreclosure and losing everything. And so finally, he just threw up his hand and said, what have I got to lose? And so they came out and they began to dig. And at a shallow level, they hit oil. And at that point in time, it was the largest oil, depart, oil deposit in North America. And so imagine, literally, overnight, Mr. Yates went from nearly losing everything from going bankrupt to becoming a billionaire. Now here's the thing. That oil had been sitting there the whole time. I mean, here he is. He's getting ready to lose everything. But, but underneath him, right there in front of him, was, was all this oil that would have made him tremendously rich. But he had never tapped into it until this point. 
And in a similar sense, as God's people, do we ever fail to tap into the vast reservoir that we have at our disposal? Because we have an opportunity to call out to God. The creator of the universe. The one who said, nothing is impossible for me. We have that opportunity. And what we need to realize as Christians, life is too big. And we are too small to start anywhere except down, our, down on our knees at His feet. Let me tell you something else about praying on your knees. It's very humbling. I, I want to encourage you to, to try it sometime. Get out on your knees and pray. And some of you say, well, well why? Why, why, why? Why bother to pray on my knees? What, what's so big about praying on your knees? Well, you're defenseless. When we're on our knees, we're vulnerable. We're in a position where we can't do anything offensively. I mean, how many of you have ever seen an army general say, okay guys, here's what I want you to do. I want every single one of you to get down on your knees because we're moving into battle. No. Why? Because when we're on our knees, we're defenseless. We are not in charge. When we are on our knees, we are lowering ourselves. We're humbling ourselves. And James says in James chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, God opposes the proud, but He gives, what church? Grace to the humble. And so He says, what? Humble yourselves before God. Humble yourselves and I will lift you up, God says. And we need to humble ourselves. We need to lower ourselves and realize, as the early church did, that you know what? We are helpless without God. We are desperate without God. And we've got to get to the point to where we depend upon Him instead of depending upon ourselves and our resources and our strength because He's the one who gave it to us anyway. Now, as I said, there's no one posture when praying to God that you need to say, okay, well, you know, this is exactly how I need to pray. In fact, posture is only useful when it, when it expresses the reality of the heart. And I say this, and I, I do it with hesitation because I, I realize that this could become a temptation for any of us. It, it can become a, really a, a religious ritual, something we can say, well, I, I marked that off of my list today. I got down on my knees and I, I prayed. And we're not really humbling ourselves. We're, we're not really lowering our hearts. We may be bowing our heads. We may be bending our knees. But are we bending our hearts and saying, God, I'm desperate and I depend upon you? We have to be very careful about rituals and doing things without thought. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13, this is what the prophet says, Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me, says God. And then you skip down to verse 15 and he says, When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. And some of you say, is that really God? I mean, would God really say, I would not listen to their prayers? Yes. What was going on? Well, they, they were just saying things that just fell from their lips and, and, and they were just kind of going through the, the motions without putting their heart into it, without putting their mind into what the, they were talking to God about. Anybody ever been guilty of that? I have. And there have been times when my kids have caught me on this. You, you ever pulled up to the dinner table? 
And man, you're really hungry, and, and so you just kind of put it on automatic pilot, and you just kind of go through the motions. You just kind of thank you, God, for the food, and you know, you, you kind of speed through it so that you can eat. There have been times when my kids, they have said to me, Dad, boy, that sure was a quick prayer. That sure was a short prayer. Now don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with short prayers. There are some really short prayers in God's Word. But what they were saying to me is, Dad, it didn't appear to us that you put a whole lot of thought into that. You were just kind of going through the motions because it's time to eat. And that's what was going on 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And God says, you know what, guys? That's detestable to me. I don't even want to listen. Your hearts are not in this at all. It's just falling from your lips. You're just checking off a list. Said my prayer today. You know, burnt my incense today. And He says, I want your heart you see, God loves a physical expression of inward reality. Take kneeling, for example. I told you we were going to look at kneeling also in the Old Testament. And most of the time when you saw them kneeling in the Old Testament, it was done out of respect and reverence. Remember what David said in Psalm chapter 95 verse 6? He says, come. He says, let us bow down in worship. Let us, what church? Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. You see, they realized that God was truly worthy of their worship and their praise. And, and some of you, you know exactly what that's like. You know, Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And sometimes we're so overwhelmed with the glory of God that it drives us to our knees, Right? God, you are, you are worthy this morning. And I, I'm telling you guys the truth. I took this picture this morning. I don't know if Eddie's here or, or not. I don't, I don't know if this is illegal or not, but I took a picture as I was driving. <laughs> Probably wasn't the safest thing, but on the way home or on the way to church this morning at 6:30, you can see I'm turning to go down uh, First Street, and I'm telling you, it was beautiful. Guys, I don't know how many of you saw this. The clouds, man, they were just huge. They stretched all the way across the sky. And they were, they were this pinkish red. And then over here, and, and this doesn't know justice. You, you see this, this huge dot over, over here? That's the moon. And as I'm driving to work, I'm seeing all of this, all of, of God's handiwork. And I turned on the radio, and guess what the song was playing, How Great Is Our God. I thought, wow. You know, it's times like that, man, when, when we see, when we see as we, we look around God's handiwork and what He's doing and, and what he, He's doing in our own lives. Uh, I'll never forget when Heather Ball came to Christ. Man, after she came up out of the baptistry, she was crying. I know Heather cries a lot. <laughs> But anyway, Heather was crying and, and she said, I am just so overwhelmed by what God has done for me. And so there are times, man, when, when just we're overwhelmed with God's glory and it drives us to our knees and we say, thank you, God. We are truly dependent upon you. We are desperate for you. There's a great passage that deals with worship in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. Here David, he doesn't ask for anything. He just spends time thanking God for His love and His goodness. And then you skip down to verse 20, and this is what it says, The whole assembly, okay, bowed low, and they fell prostrate before the Lord. And the king. You see, bowing low, getting on their knees was a natural response to God's glory and God's power. 
U.S. Attorney General, or at least he was U.S. Attorney General several years ago, John Ashcroft. Um, he actually wrote a book entitled Lessons from a Father to a Son. And it's, it's a really interesting book. He, he talks about how he would wake up to the sound of his father praying in the mornings. And he said, and, and when he was elected as a U.S. Senator, the day he was to be installed, his dad wanted him to come by and pray with him before he went to Washington. And when he went by, his father was in such bad health, and in fact, he died shortly after this moment. But he went by to see his father, and when he got there, his father was struggling to get out of bed. And he told his dad, he said, Dad, 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 he said, you don't have to, to stand up. And his dad said, I'm not struggling to stand, I'm, tr I'm struggling to kneel. So that he could pray for his son. And he said, it was be because of times like that, he said, that I start every day with a prayer. What if our sons, what if our daughters occasionally walked in on us and caught us praying? What if our kids, what if our grandkids saw how important prayer was to us? What do you think that would communicate to them? Well, let me mention one other thing that the first century church realized about prayer. And this time we're going to look to James. James chapter 5 verse 16. James, the brother of Jesus, writes, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is what church? is powerful and effective. You see, the first century church, they realized that prayer was powerful. And when they prayed, man, it made a difference. It was effective. But the, the problem is, do, do we believe that? Even today as Christians, do, do we believe that? I, I really believe that there are Christians today who would say, man, I definitely believe in God, but they struggle with believing in the power and the effectiveness of prayer. You guys probably heard the story about um, the, the bar that came to this small town, and because of the bar, um, all kinds of, of stuff was going on within the, the town, and, and it wasn't good stuff. And so there was a preacher, and, and, and the congregation that he worked with, they started praying that the bar would, would be removed. In fact, they started having prayer services and they were fasting that God would remove this bar. And one night, the bar was struck with lightning and it burned to the ground. And man, the bar owner was furious. And he knew about all the prayer meetings and so guess what he did? He took that preacher in, in the church to court. And so as they were standing there in court, you've got the, the bar, the, the, the owner of the bar who is, you know, arguing that, that the church prayed and God burned down his building. And then you've got the preacher in the congregation and they're denying it. They're saying, we prayed, but we never imagined anything like this happening. And the, the judge just stepped back and he said, wow. He said, I've never experienced anything like this. You have a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer and you have a preacher in a church that doesn't. <laughs> Do we believe in the power of prayer? Study after study done by even secular organizations show the power of prayer. I'll tell you guys a story. I don't think I've ever shared this with you. And uh, it's kind of funny how God works. I had a, a minister, a friend of mine, who messaged me this week. And he said, hey man, he said, I know you believe in prayer. And he said, you've told me some of your stories before. And he said, can, can I use a couple? Can you share a couple with me? And this is one of them I, I shared with him this week. Liesl was probably, I'm guessing, three, four years old. And we went to 
um, an ice cream shop. And in this shop, they had tables. They were granite tables, table tops, and they had a thin strip all the way around the, the center of, of that table top almost like a razor blade. And, and this tabletop was top heavy because it, it, it was sitting on these, these little bitty rickety legs. And, and so Liesl and one of her little friends was sitting at one of those tables and Liesl decided she wanted to get down. So she's climbing out of the chair and she uses the table to help her get down. And when she does, the table comes down on top of her and it hits her right across the head. And, and I mean, it just slashes it wide open and blood's going everywhere. And, and Julie, I'm sitting there stunned, Julie... Uh, has enough uh, just composure to go over and grab her up and we run out the door to the emergency room. And we get to the emergency room and she's screaming and, and she's crying. I mean, there's doctors and there's lights and there's blood and, and she's in a lot of pain. And, and they finally get her back and the doctor says, listen, he said she's going to have to have stitches on the inside and the outside. And he said, I cannot do this with her moving. And he said, I know she's little. And he said, I, but we've got to, to do something. He said, I'm going to have my nurses come in and we're going to have to, to hold her down. She cannot move as I'm trying to stitch her up. And so at that point, Julie and I, we went over to her before he started stitching. And she's just crying and she's hysterical. And we just prayed over here, prayed over her that she would calm down. And that she would know that God's with her and everything was going to be okay. The doctor got the, the needle ready with the stitch. And I kid you not, before he made the first stitch, she went right to sleep. And he started stitching her up. And right before he finished, he stopped. This is an older doctor. And he looked at Julie and I and he said, In all my years of medicine... I've never seen anything like this. And I'm telling you the truth. You probably won't believe me. But I'm telling you the truth. After he made that last stitch, her eyes go boop. And she woke up. But she went to sleep that entire time he was stitching her up. as an answered prayer. I've told you guys before, several years ago, I got a letter from the IRS, late you owe a lot of money. And let me tell you, when somebody says you owe a lot of money, it will drive you to your knees. And I was panicking, and I was praying, and I was calling out to God. And in the end, it was a mistake. And we ended up getting money back from the IRS. Here recently, I had a friend who was trying to, to have a baby. And his wife had endometriosis, really bad, severe case. And they had not been able to have children. And, and they went to a doctor. The doctor said, it is impossible for you to have children. You're going to have to get on this medication. And, and hopefully you'll be able to, to have children. But at this point, it's impossible for you to have children. And, and she was telling us are telling our family this. And I said, let me tell you something. Nothing's impossible with God. I said, let's pray about it. And she said, well, the doctor said, if I got pregnant at this point, it'd be a miracle. I said, well, we're going to pray about it because nothing's impossible with God. And we prayed about it for several months. One night I get a text on my phone. They had not been back to get the medicine. And the message said, my wife's pregnant. I'm going to tell you guys, none of those things had anything to do with me. It had everything to do with God. Nothing, you hear me, is impossible with Him. And you can talk to Him. You can communicate with God. Now the skeptic says, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. Falling asleep during stitches, getting money back from the IRS, being able to have a baby slate, that's just ridiculous. What you don't understand, you Christians, you're always exaggerating. Those are coincidences. Okay, well here's what I've discovered. When I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't pray, coincidences don't happen. You with me? 
Isn't it amazing how that works? It's like one person said, coincidences are simply answered prayers where God just chooses to be an office. I like that. When we pray confidently, believing that the God in the universe is personally involved in our lives, let me tell you something, guys. We will be amazed. Martin Luther once said, None can believe how powerful prayer is, but those who have learned it by experience. And I'm telling you, I've had some amazing experiences in talking to God. But I want to encourage you to go deeper. That's what this whole series has been about. We're concluding it today. And, and, and what I hope you'll see is, you know what? You need to be praying more than just at services like, like today. You need to be praying more than just in the morning or, or maybe before a meal throughout the day. You need to be continually talking to God. Going to God on behalf of, of, of those around you. Continually, constantly praying. I want to close out the, our series with this, and I've said it throughout the entire series, and I'm saying it because I've had so many people who have told me they're intimidated by prayer. And they've said to me, Slate, I don't, I don't know how to pray. And again, what I want you to understand is prayer is just a conversation with God. Just as you would have a conversation with your spouse or a conversation with a coworker, or, or a conversation with, with a, a, a friend. You're, you're just you're having a conversation. You're, you're talking to God. You're, you're pouring out your, your heart to Him. And when you pray, pray believing and knowing that God is listening. And He is involved and He is working in your situation. He may not answer it the way you think He should, but God will answer your prayer. And I can guarantee you, at the end of the day, he will answer it in a way that is best. And so lift up prayers to God. Talk to God. This, this morning we want to extend an invitation. Before we do that, I, I would like to close out this series with a prayer like we did this morning. I want to give you the opportunity to take just a, a few moments to pray yourself. For some, of the, for some of you, this may be the first time you've prayed today. For some of you, this may be the first time you've prayed ever. But I want to give you this opportunity to take this time to talk to Him. Just pour out your heart to God and talk to Him today. And I'll close this out. God, we thank you so much for being the God that you are. A God that listens. A God that cares. God, we thank you so much for all the prayers that you've answered. Even the prayers that we might not thought had been answered, but you were working, you were there. And you were involved in each and every one of those situations. God, we just pray your will, and that's so hard for us at times. We want our will, and, and there are times where we feel like we know what's best. 
But God, you ultimately know from beginning to end. And so, Father, help us to trust you, to put our faith in you, in your goodness, in your kindness, and your love for each and every one of us. God, we've prayed this morning for some individuals who are struggling physically. They're struggling in their health. And God, we know that nothing is impossible with you. We believe that with all our heart. And Father, we lift up each and every one of these individuals to you. And we're praying for healing for them, Father. But again, we're also praying your will. But Father, I thank you so much for each and every one who's here today. For some, it was, it was a struggle to be here today. For some, I, I realize they're hurting. They're struggling in their marriage. Maybe they're struggling with an addiction. They're struggling with a wayward child. They're struggling with an abusive parent. But they're struggling. And Father, I just pray that you will work in each individual's life that are here today and even in the lives of those who aren't present, God. I just pray your blessings over them and pray that you will continue to let your glory and your honor shine out through this world, through us. And Father, we just pray all these things in the power of Jesus' name. Amen.